Hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Today we have Dr. Amanda Gumbert, and she's an Extension Water Quality Specialist, and she'll be talking about the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. We also have Kai Davis with our Wildlife Sounds, and he is a forestry grad, and um, he does a lot of bird sounds for us, and so get ready to put in the chat pod what you think his sounds might be. Um, we always look forward to that. And um, lastly, we have Gwen Henderson. She is an education director at the Kentucky Archaeological Survey at Western Kentucky University. And she's going to be talking about what the Ohio River looked like um, based on Native people and water. And um, it's going to be a really great segment um, to combine with what uh, Dr. Gumbert is going to be talking about. Um, so um, we have a full lineup today. So I want to go ahead and get started. So uh, Dr. Gumbert, if you'd like to go ahead and um, Pull up your camera. I will. Hi. Hi, Renee. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me again and joining us. Yeah, I'm excited I'm about, about this. sharing with folks about the, the Clean Water Act. And um, let me get my, are you ready for me to share? So I'm going to trust that you can see that the right way and we'll just go right ahead. Um, so we're going to talk about the 50th um, anniversary of the Clean Water Act, which is coming up this October, October of 2022. Um, and so just to um, to just orient folks um, and remind you, if you don't know already, that the goal of the Clean Water Act um, has been to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water. So it is a federal piece of legislation. Um, we will talk a little bit specifically about how it relates to Kentucky, um, but just to, you know, to drive home the, the point that this is a critical tool that um, we can use um, nationwide to ensure safe and healthy waters. Um, and remind folks to the effectiveness of the Clean Water Act really is increased when we have citizen um, awareness and engagement. So I mentioned the Kentucky specific part. So in Kentucky, um, our uh, watersheds, our large watersheds are also known as river basins. That's another way that we talk about them. And so you can look on this map and locate uh, where you live and work, and you'll recognize um, all those river basins, I think. And so um, that's how the Division of Water, the Kentucky Division of Water, which is our state regulatory agency, that's how they start to kind of divide up and manage our water resources in the state is on these river basin scales. Um, and we do have a lot of water resources in Kentucky. If you've heard me speak before, um, you've probably heard or seen these facts um, uh, shown as well. So we have over 90,000 miles of streams and rivers in the state and four, over 440,000 acres of lakes. So that's a lot of water. It's a lot of surface water. Typically in Kentucky, though, our surface and our groundwater um, are intricately connected through our karst geology. And so uh, what's on the ground is in our water, so to speak. So it's above ground, below ground, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So we also have ways that we use water in Kentucky. And you'll see these little symbols um, later on in the presentation, but I just wanted to kind of go through what we as water folk um, call designated uses. And um, it's a little bit of a jargon, but this is all stuff that makes will make sense to you. So primary contact recreation, swimming, or any kind of activity where you could be immersed in the water. Um, secondary contact recreation is when we maybe are fishing or boating. And so um, our water quality standards might not be quite as strict um, because we're probably not going to get that water or we're less likely to get the water in our mouth. Um, aquatic life is um, where we're interested in the quality of the water to support wildlife and specifically fish, um, mussels, as well as aquatic insects. Um, our domestic water supply is just what that sounds like, Where, what water bodies we are getting municipal drinking water sources um, from. And then fish consumption is when we're concerned about contaminants like mercury and how that might affect those who are eating um, the fish and 
predominantly we're concerned about women of childbearing age, but also children and sometimes elderly populations. Um, and then finally, another way that we look at our water resources in Kentucky are outstanding state resource waters or OSRWs. And these are ones that are really high quality um, waters or they have um, um, special or specific habitats that are maintained in those waterways. And they're ones that typically will focus on protecting. So all of these different uses and the way we use water in Kentucky will help us, and I say us in a general sense, but they help, especially the regulatory agency, um, kind of create a report card for what's going on in our streams and rivers and our water in the state. And we start to determine if our waters are healthy or not, or if they might need a little bit of assistance to, to be better. So getting back to the Clean Water Act um, and give you a little bit of history. So the Federal Water Pollution Control Act um, of 1948 was really our first major piece of legislation um, that was um, supposed to address water pollution. But it was a little vague, I would say, and there were really no defined goals or objectives or any kind of um, like uh, limits in terms of pollutants um, or really much in terms of guidelines. And so it was it was there, but it was, you know, left a bit to be desired. Um, along comes the 1950s and 60s, and there were some amendments that were made to the 1948 statute. We started to see uh, more federal assistance um, toward folks and mun municipalities, really, that were discharging sewage. So a lot of it um, had to do with what we would call point sources of pollution. And I'll show you an image of that in just a minute. Um, but sewage specifically was starting to be addressed and how we could keep our wastewater out of our freshwater resources. Um, there was some enforcement for those who were discharging. There also began um, to be included in in the law this um, dealing with navigable intrastate waters. Um, so not just between states, but within states. Um, and then there were some water quality standards that were added in the mid 60s. However, there was this growing interest within society of environmental issues and more environmental awareness. And so there was a bit of frustration um, about how limiting or kind of lacking this legislation was. Also kind of in that 1960s and late 50s, early 60s um, timeframe, we start to see some, um, some popular um, literature being available and most specifically Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. So that was published in 1962. Um, anybody who is, has thought about or considered environmental issues, I'm sure has heard of Silent Spring and perhaps you've read that as well. Um, but it was Rachel Carson's call to action and, and really wanted to call the public's attention to the fact that using insecticides was having a negative impact to um, wildlife and specifically with bird populations. And so um, this book led to a nationwide ban on DDT for agricultural uses. Um, and then also, in um, the late 60s, the paperback version of Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac came about. It had already been published in hardcover in the late 40s, but then um, the paperback edition seemed to get a little more, a little more traction and folks start thinking about a land ethic and what that really means. And so lots of, of course, in this time too, we had a lot of social unrest and you know, just folks really paying attention to what was going on in their environment. Um, and then cue in the Cuyahoga River. And so the, the all these dates that are popping up on the screen, these are all years in which the Cuyahoga River caught on fire. Um, and so newsflash, rivers aren't supposed to burn. Um, but when you have pollution and discharges from industry that are discharging um, chemicals that are flammable, um, and you know, we what results is uh, significant fires. And in 1969, there was a significant fire on the Cuyahoga River that was really kind of the tipping point for, hey, we've got to do a better job taking care of our water resources in the state, in the United States. And so in the 19 early 19, 1970 I, itself, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. Um, also in 1970, we have the first. Earth Day that occurs. And so we're so all of these things are kind of coming together 
and um, creating a lot of um, social demand and, and, and scientific demand and interest in having the Clean Water Act. And so the Clean Water Act, as we know it, um, was established in 1972. Um, in October, I believe the, the official date is October 18, 1972. So we're moving toward 50 years um, very quickly this year. And the two broad components that were included in that early um, Clean Water Act was federal assistance for municipal sewage treatment plants. So again, a focus on wastewater. And then it also provided regulatory requirements for industrial and municipal dischargers um, and some water quality standards that were established. So this was like when we're actually looking at specific numbers and goals of what we think, you know, kind of that report card thing of saying, you know, where do we fall on the scale? Are our waters uh, clean and what do they, where should they hit in with some of those parameters to be considered clean and healthy? So just for a second, I want to point out these categories of pollution because this is kind of where the Clean Water Act kind of has two major parts. We think about point sources, which um, probably the early lessons that you've had about water quality really kind of relate back to point sources of pollution. Is there a pipe that I can identify and point to that says this is discharging sewage or some other contaminant into the water body? That's what we, it's very identifiable, single, single point and single source of pollution versus non-point source, which is a little uh, less specific and runoff can come from many places. So all the ways that we use our landscape impacts the quality of water that runs off of it. And so that non-point source means that there are lots of different contributors to uh, water pollution. And so we kind of, that's how I've learned to think about water quality and how uh, we protect water resources. Are, are we looking for point sources of pollution or are we looking for non-point sources? And most of my work falls under that non-point source. So goals of the um, 1972 Clean Water Act, again, like I said earlier, restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. So that's really what we're trying to, to get at. We're trying to eliminate discharge of pollutants into navigable waters by 1985, achieve water quality that provides for protection and propagation of fish and wildlife and recreation, um, and then also prohibit the discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts. So that's where we're starting to put regulation and controls on industrial polluters. So think about, um, you know, the early maybe textile mills, paper mills, things that were located near water bodies. They're using the river water uh, for part of their industrial production, but then they, when they're finished with it and their process water needs to be discharged somewhere, then they may have discharged it right back out into the river. So the Cuyahoga River was a good example um, of that. The Reedy River, I was recently in Greenville, South Carolina, and the Reedy River that runs through town there um, was also um, polluted locally by a lot of textile mills, and they talked about how it would just be a rainbow of colors. And now um, the state, the community has worked together to restore that river. But these are the kind of things that the, the act is, was focused on. And this achieving water quality to, pro, to protect wildlife and preserve recreational opportunities, those have proven to be a little more difficult to achieve. And part of the, um, the one thing I want to also point out, and this is kind of where we start to get a little bit of conflict among users and interest groups, is well, like what do we consider to be a water or a water body of the United States that would fall under the Clean Water Act and be and be subject to regulation? And so that's really where some of that you've probably heard of WOTUS, people talking about waters of the U.S. And those are really points of ongoing conflict. Is uh, resistance to regulatory implication versus that interest in um, a more comprehensive interpretation of the water bodies that qualify for protection. And that's an ongoing discussion um, even still today. Now in Kentucky, we have specified what it means um, to be a water of the Commonwealth. 
So in Kentucky, our, like I mentioned, Kentucky Division of Water um, does the is the regulatory arm for enforcing the Clean Water Act here in the state. Um, and so they have then clarified what it means to be a water of the Commonwealth. Um, and so it's a pretty broad definition. Um, any and all rivers, streams, creeks, lakes, ponds, impounding reservoirs, springs, wells, marshes, and all other bodies of surface or underground water, natural or artificial, situated wholly or partly within or bordering upon the Commonwealth or within its jurisdiction. So that's a pretty wide definition of waters of the Commonwealth. And so that's where we can get into trouble. Uh, industry, sometimes agriculture, uh, municipalities, is if we are um, in a situation where we are polluting the waters of the Commonwealth. So we're always looking for those best management practices that we can use on the farm, in the forest, in town, in our communities, so that we're protecting the waters of the Commonwealth. So again, remember, we're those categories of pollution could be a point source or a non-point source. So that you can kind of see now how non-point source really kind of gets tricky to implement. So managing point sources is a little easier. Um, we, can, we can point to those pipes. We can identify industry that may be um, discharging water or process water into a water body, and they're required to have a permit. And that permit is renewed every five years, and it and it kind of gives them a, a prescription for how much they can discharge. And so there's monitoring that has to be done there. With non-point sources, much more difficult to manage. So the sources are hard to identify. You know, if you see um, sediment or you see kind of a, a muddy stream of water that's flowing into a bigger uh, water body, it may be hard to tell where that sediment is coming from. It could be a construction site. It could be bare ground in a, in a neighborhood. It could be an ag um, operation. It could be lots of different things, and it could be more than one thing. So that's really hard to manage. So kind of getting back to like, how do we know what the quality of, of water is in Kentucky? Um, we have on a two-year cycle, we have to report back to Congress what the quality of water is within Kentucky. And so you can find that um, in the integrated report. That's what the Kentucky Division of Water um, calls that report that they send to Congress every two years. And it pulls together the monitoring that they as a state agency do, um, as well as that kind of measurement of, you know, are our streams healthy or not? And so they create, um, they have a really nice new tool. It's a dashboard. Now, I know that that's relative because I'm kind of a, a, a science geek here. And so I look at these maps I'm like, oh, this is an exciting way to look, a visual representation of some of this data. Um, and um, I'll click in a little closer there. So take a note of the, the uh, map of Kentucky and you see all those um, red, yellow, and green squiggles on there. And those are all of our streams that have been monitored. And that's the database. Um, there's also this Kentucky Water Health Portal. I think as an, as an individual, this is probably the best interface. You can just Google Kentucky Water Health Portal. Um, and you can select a, if you know the name of your stream that you live by, you can select um, a spring, a lake, and you can also search by address. And so you can find the name of the, the creek that you live closest to and find out when it was monitored um, most recently and what the quality of that water is from that monitoring. And so these little squiggles kind of follow the stoplight um, concept, meaning if it's green, you're good to go. So quality, high quality water, and you're meeting the designated use. So remember that primary contact recreation or um, aquatic habitat or drinking water. Um, so if it's green, it means you're good to go. Um, if it's yellow, it means it might not be meeting one or one of its designated uses. And if it's red, then that means it's impaired. And so there is something going on. And so as a water manager, we can look at that and go, gracious, there's something going on in those water bodies. What can we do on the landscape to help improve water quality? So, and I wanted to point out too, that the three major pollutants that we deal with here in Kentucky 
are primarily sediment. So that's soil, that soil that is um, either running off from bare ground or a lot of times it's sloughing off of a stream bank. So it's scouring a stream bank and depositing into the stream. Pathogens, we're talking about E. coli, fecal coliform, um, things that may come from you know, those pathogens that are things that could get into our, our bodies and make us sick. And so that's a, a big concern. And then also we have nutrients in, in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus that are real problems for our water resources. Now, not all doom and gloom. So I wanna make sure that I share with you that um, we have, have ways that we can be good uh, managers, managers of our landscape. And so my favorite one, of course, are stream buffers. And um, we can show how we can have trees, shrubs, and a variety of vegetation on the stream bank that will help hold soil in place, can also, with those buffers, we can prevent um, direct access from other animals that might get into the stream, like livestock, um, that could contribute nutrient or pathogen pollutants into the water. Um, but as to have healthy buffers, it's gonna help us have healthy water. And when we're talking about forestry operations, we're really thinking about SMZs or those stream side management zones. So if we're going to do a harvest, these are the practices we're gonna use and it's in turn going to protect water, water resources. So finally, just to wrap up, a few ways that you can get involved if you wanna know more about the Clean Water Act. This might be all that you ever wanna know about the Clean Water Act. But um, remember we said the Clean Water Act is most effective when we have involvement from our citizens. So providing public comment is a way to do that. So find out if there are permits being issued. The state always put the, puts those out for public comment and review. You can sign up for email notifications from the Kentucky Division of Water. Um, you can learn more about your local water bodies through that Kentucky Water Health Portal that I showed you. Also, you might be interested in being a volunteer water monitor through Watershed Watch. And then finally, you know, ensuring that clean water is a focal point for you, your family, and your community. Um, you can do that by using best management practices and also recruiting others to get involved with you as well. Um, and so I'll stop there. Um, if you have questions, you can reach out to me. I do want to take a, a moment to recognize uh, Melissa McAllister. I borrowed a lot of her slides for this program and this presentation. She is a the Kentucky River Basin Coordinator. So each of those major river basins um, that um, I talked about earlier have a coordinator. And um, so you can find those folks and reach out to them as well, and they can help you with questions you've got. Well, thank you, Dr. Gumbert. We greatly appreciate that. Um, appreciate you uh, giving that presentation. And, you know, it always amazes me how it took so long to realize we actually needed clean water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? I mean, it's like, wow. And, and only we're really only 50 years in. That's a long time, you know, to wait around to say, oh, well, we should maybe make some rules about how we use water. <laughs> right, exactly. But, you know, we live and learn, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. We gr I greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Renee. All right. So coming up next, we have Kai Davis um, with What's That Sound? Um, so Kai, if you want to go ahead and turn your camera on. Welcome to the show again. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you're having me again. I appreciate it. Greatly appreciate you being here. And um, so I guess we will guess what kind of uh, animal or I guess you're doing birds today again, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, um, what kind of birds and people can put that in the chat pod when they have an answer. So yeah, so yeah. Started. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's get started. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen and everything's working well. Um, so my name is Kai Davis. Um, I am a forestry master's student here at UK. And today I'm gonna be talking about some wildlife sounds and introducing some birds. Uh, so every, every time I'm invited on, I do a different color theme for birds. Um, this time it'll be our first multicolor bird. So we have like a black or grayish uh, and orange bird. Uh, so there's two. So one is going to be a local bird that you'll find throughout the year around uh, here. And then the other one is going to be a migratory bird that you'll find around the time that I'm doing this. So it's obviously July. So it'll be a bird that you'll find around this time. Um, but anyway, um, Woohoo, my cool little animation. All right, so welcome and let's get started. So 
The first bird, like I said, is local. And this is going to be the call that you'll hear. All right, so this is typically typically going to be the location that you'll find it, but this this bird that I'm um, showing is going to be found pretty everywhere. So if you do know it, put it in the chat. If not, I'm about to reveal it. So this is actually the American robin. Um, so. For the mnemonic, the way to recognize a robin call is going to be kind of like a cheerily, cheer up, cheer up, cheerily, cheerily. Uh, and that's kind of what you hear. And it's kind of like that swooping up, swooping up uh, call. Um, so I'll go ahead and play it for you again so you can hear it. All right, so hopefully you heard it. Um, so that's going to be an American Robin. And like I said, you'll pretty much see these everywhere. Um, so anyway, let's learn some more about this, this bird, this American Robin. Uh, so going into the life history and uh, behavior of the American Robin, um, they're pretty industrious birds. Uh, and they're bounding across lawns. That's primarily where you'll see them. Uh, right next to the sidewalks, just hopping around. Uh, like I said, they're pretty much found everywhere around here. Um, and then during the fall and winter, the robins will often roost in groups in large flocks, and then they'll spend most of their times in trees. However, in the springtime and in um, the, that's where we start to see the males starting to attract the females, and we'll start to see them lower on the ground more so. And they display certain um, mating behaviors, uh, trying to attract them, which, which includes like shaking their uh, their wings and inflating their uh, throats, uh, singing. So you'll start to hear more singing in the springtime too. Um, and then it's kind of cute when they find their pairs, uh, the male and female will do a display together where they're opening their mouths uh, and hop towards each other. And then they'll like rub their bills together. So. It's kind of cute to see that and to see that the mating and attraction kind of work in the wild. Um, and then they're also strong, straight, fast flyers too. Um, so in terms of their diet, they eat different types of food depending on the time of day. So more earthworms in the morning and then more fruit later on in the day. Um, they eat large numbers of both invertebrates and fruit. Uh, and particularly in the spring and summer, they eat large numbers of earthworms as well as insects and, and snails. Um, but uh, later on in the, the years, uh, they'll start to eat more fruit, uh, which include berries and things like that. Uh, and then one study even suggested that uh, they try to supplement and um, get a round diet based on what they're eating. So they'll try and eat uh, fruits with bugs in them. So they're kind of smart like that. Uh, in terms of their habitat and location, uh, in this map, it shows where they're found. So like I said, everywhere around here. So you can see them all across uh, North America, which is really interesting. It's a super common bird around here. Um, they're pretty familiar in towns and cities, um, but they're also found in like wider areas too. Uh, and, and that includes mountain forests and even the Alaskan wilderness, which I thought was pretty interesting just imagining seeing a robin that I would see in my yard, um, also being found in like Alaskan wilderness. Um, and then during the winter, uh, many of robins may move to like moist woods where more berry producing uh, trees and shrubs are found. Um, so they're found uh, all across the continent in gardens, parks, yards, golf courses, fields, tundras, forests, shrublands, all around. Um, so within conservation and the threats, um, robins, they forest largely on lawns, so they can be quite vulnerable to pesticide poisoning, and they can be an important indicator for chemical pollution as well as other urban environmental issues. Uh, so um, we kind of heard about that with like Silent Spring, uh, with uh, Carson's book, and part of the reason why it's called Silent Spring is because of all the birds that ended up dying and there weren't as many birds calling. 
and the birds like the robin are going to be the ones that are going to be calling in the spring that, that they would no longer hear them. So they're a good indicator for urban environmental issues. Uh, like I said, they're numerous and widespread and their population are around um, like 30, 370 million. Um, and they've slightly increased about uh, 0.13% uh, every year from 1966 to uh, 2019. And then lastly, some fun facts about the robin. They eat a lot of fruit in the fall and winter, like I said. Uh, and then when they eat honeysuckle berries exclusively, sometimes they can become uh, a little intoxicated. So that's kind of funny that this robin can get a little drunk sometimes. Um, and then the, the saying of the early bird gets the worm is kind of from the American robin. Uh, their rich car caroling and song is primarily what you're going to hear first at uh, dawn, right at first light. So, and they eat worms too. So that's kind of where that early bird gets the worm comes from. Um, and then it's also interesting that like Western populations are a little bit different in coloration than the Eastern populations. Uh, so Western are often a little bit more pale than the uh, Eastern populations. So that is the American Robin. Um, next up, I almost gave away the answer, but uh, this is the, the next one. You'll primarily find it in the picture that I'm showing. So here we go. So this is the Baltimore Oriole. Um, and this one is a little difficult to identify. I'm still new at identifying some of these birds. Um, and this one is still one that I'm trying to train myself to listen to out in the wild. Um, and this, there's not really a mnemonic for the Baltimore Oriole, at least I haven't seen or heard one. Um, but their, their songs are described to be like clean and flowy and like whistling. Um, and then there's like a series of paired notes within it that you might hear. And that lasts like a one to two seconds. Um, and it's kind of fluty. So you'll kind of hear that flute. Um, but then there's, it's, it's kind of specific. There aren't many birds around here that are going to sound too similar to an Oriole. But uh, it, it's definitely one that I'm still getting used to hearing. Uh, but I'll play it again for you all. So yeah, it's a it's a bunch of different calls too. So uh, it's really interesting. Um, like I like I said, um, but we'll learn it together and we'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, let's learn some more about this Baltimore Oriole. Um, so first, if it decides to work, maybe. All right, there we go. All right. So going into the life history and behavior of uh, the Baltimore Oriole. I'm showing this picture and it looks a little different from what we're seeing here. And that's because this picture now is a female. So uh, one of the interesting things about this one is that the male and female uh, have sex specific colors. So the male is gonna be displaying more of this vibrant orange uh, chest color and a black uh, back and top, uh, while the female is gonna be more yellow, orange and gray wings. Um, so that's kind of interesting with their life history. Um, and in terms of singing, the male sings to establish and defend a breeding territory. Um, so you may not hear a full song uh, if you're outside of the breeding grounds or outside of the, the breeding time period. Um, and then the female Baltimore Oriole, they also sing. Uh, their songs are a bit shorter. Uh, and occasionally mating pairs will sing a duet. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then also in uh, Central North America, uh, the populations of the Baltimore Oriole overlaps with the Bullock's Oriole. Um, and they, they can kind of confuse uh, bird watchers because they look pretty similar. Um, and then what is even more confusing is that they can breed, uh, crossbreed between those two uh, particular species. And then they produce a hybrid offspring that 
is brighter than a typical Bullock's, but it is uh, darker and more dull than a typical uh, Baltimore Oriole. And that's just completely confusing because we don't really know like or which one is it? And it's just a hybrid offspring. Um, there are many birds that defend large territories, but Orioles aren't necessarily a big defensive bird that um, defend large swaths of their territory. So we can see a lot of different Orioles uh, eating together and things like that. Um, so going into their diet. So unlike robins, uh, they prefer more ripe and dark colored fruits, uh, which is pretty interesting. And then beyond fruit, they also eat insects and ne nectar. Um, and then their food proportion varies throughout the season. So in the summertime, uh, while they're breeding and feeding their young, much of their diet is gonna consist of insects, which are more protein um, and needed for the growth. And then in the spring and fall, we start to see more nectar and ripe fruits in their diet because these sugary foods are readily converted into fats, which uh, can be stored and used for the migration um, when they're traveling. Um, they also eat a wide variety of insects. So beetles, crickets, grasshoppers, even small uh, other small invertebrates. Um, but they can also be considered pest species um, because they can uh, damage fruit crops. Like I said, they eat a lot of fruits. So any of those raspberries, uh, cherries, oranges, and bananas, they can uh, mm -hmm. damage some of those crops and things like that. All right, so going into the habitat, uh, they're found mainly high in leafy deciduous trees, but not necessarily in deep forests. So like the picture I showed earlier, it was just like a common park that you would find like throughout the city, um, but it's gonna be more old growth forest within the city. So they like that. They're usually found high in those trees. Um, so they like open woodlands, forest edges, orchards, uh, um, stands across rivers and in parks and in backyards even. Uh, they've adapted well to human settlements. So that's why we can start to see them feeding and nesting in the parks and orchards and backyards. Um, so now in terms of migration, uh, so in this picture, you can see um, this is their wintering, the, the blue at the bottom, and then their migration is going to be the yellow uh, where they're traveling through. And then uh, the kind of orange or red, depending on how your screen displays it, is going to be where their breeding grounds are. So you can see Lexington, which is primarily like right here, uh, we're going to be right in that uh, my, or that breeding ground. Um, so they're medium to long distance migrants and they migrate in flocks. Uh, they typically spend the summer uh, and winter in different ranges, like I said. Uh, so around to, uh, early April to late May, they start to arrive in their breeding grounds uh, in that red. Um, and then as early as July to August, they'll start to travel back down to their wintering grounds um, down here. So we're starting, we're right on the tail end of their time here in their breeding grounds. So um, this will be your last chance to see them in this year if you can. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, cool. So get out there if you can. Um, and then their conservation and threats. Uh, their population has been declining about 0.84% uh, per year. Um, and it's a cumulative uh, decline of like 36% during 1966 to 2019. Uh, but their global population is still at 12 million. So their species are relatively low conservation concern. Uh, and some of the threats that they face uh, because they breed in North America in winter in South, uh, Central and South America, they're vulnerable to deforestation and habitat loss. Um, and then insecticides can also affect them indirectly by what they're eating. They're the insect that they prey on, but then they can also be poisoned directly by the insecticides. Um, they also migrate at night, so they can be disoriented by lights and rainstorms and things like that. And they can crash into tall structures like skyscrapers or radio towers. Um, and then lastly, one fun fact that I have, the Baltimore Oriole uh, gets their name from their colors. Um, and they're, it's actually from, uh, the Baltimore family in England, Old England, uh, who displayed their family crest colors of this. Uh, so they got their name from that family. And coincidentally, uh, it's also how Baltimore, Maryland got their name uh, from that same family of England. 
Um, but yeah, so that is all uh, today. So today we have the American Robin and the Baltimore Oriole. So thank you. Thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate you doing that. And, um, you know, it's it's funny because when I heard that Robin, I thought, well, I wonder if that's a Robin. Most of the time, like there's one that lives under my porch every summer. I don't know if it's the same Robin or they're just very good at, you know, making that nest in that same spot. Um, but usually what I'm hearing and it's like, tweet, tweet, tweet. I think it's wanting <laughs> us to be away from its babies, obviously. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so they're that's not normally what I hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So their their songs are going to be different from their calls, and their calls can be for different reasons. Like, yeah, stay away from my nests. Like, I have babies, or and their songs are primarily just going to be uh, sending out messages, uh, trying to attract the mate, depending on when you're hearing it and things like that, or uh, just because, just regular communication. So yeah. All right. Well. It's always interesting and a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing if you can do another one sometime soon. All right. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. All right. So next we have um, Gwen Henderson. Gwen, if you want to turn your camera on. Um, she is the Education Director of the Kentucky Archaeological Survey at Western Kentucky University. And thank you very much for being on today. I'm really pleased. Really pleased to be here. This is the first time I've been on. It's so exciting. Ellen has talked to me about it, and here I am. It's just great. Let me share my screen here. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. You know, it's really interesting in the learning about the Clean Water Act and now what you're going to discuss. So, yeah. yeah. Who knew there was a connection, right? Exactly. And and it seems it seems sort of counterintuitive, I guess. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Like I said, and. Um, it may seem counterintuitive to talk about uh, archaeology and water because water is a flowing, you know, feature and archaeology does excavation and survey and so forth. But it's the, um, the role that mussels, freshwater mussels play in native people's lives and the fact that they use them and then deposit them in the places where they used to live means that we can talk about archaeology's window into ancient water quality. What you see on the screen there are uh, Native American women from around 4,000 BC to, uh, let's say around 4,000 BC who are collecting freshwater mussels in the Green River Valley. Okay, so the Green River Shell Mound Archaic hunters and gatherers are some of the best known ones who really um, we would connect with um, freshwater mussels. You can see in this slide an excavation unit at a site in Ohio County, and all of the white specks there are mussel shells combined with other trash to create what's called a shell midden. The Green River Shell Mound shell midden sites are National Historic Landmarks because of their significant contribution to our understanding about ancient native ways of life. Okay, but today I'm going to talk more about uh, mussel shells and Fort Ancient farming peoples who lived in central Kentucky. And what you see here are examples of a village in an upland environment and a village along a river. Native peoples used freshwater mussels for a host of reasons. Um, malacologists will tell you that mussels, freshwater mussels, taste really bad. And so you'd have to be really hungry to eat them. But it's not just for food. These freshwater mussels were used as the raw material for ornaments. They were, as you can see here, the raw material for hose really heavy mussel shells lashed onto handles and used in tilling their farm fields. Other uses for mussel shell that native peoples put those shells to included crushing up the shell and adding it to clay to temper their pottery so that they would be hard and watertight. And also shell spoons that would be used for serving and also um, for uh, working with pottery. Okay. 
the native peoples who lived near rivers, like this ancient shell midden along the Green River, but in other places too, deposited these shells near where they lived. When archeologists investigate native sites, campsites, village sites, they will find the trash at those sites. And it's this trash, analyzing the trash and then making inferences from the shells in the trash that give us a window onto the ancient water quality of Kentucky's rivers. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the Thompson site in Greenup County. It was a village site next to the Ohio River that colleagues and I investigated. We know that the native peoples lived there from about 1000 to, to 1200, 1000 to 1200 AD. So centuries ago, the materials from the Thompson site can provide us a window into the water quality of the Ohio River. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about mussels and how it is that we can use them as an inference for water quality. And our previous speaker explained to us the role that water quality, how, how important it is for, um, for human use and cultures. And these freshwater mussels, which from a certain perspective look kind of, I don't know, um, not particularly exciting, although I'm sure malacologists would uh, take umbrage with that statement, but they're very diverse and they are very important for water quality. Here's an example of some different kinds of species uh, from the Green River. You can see the diversity there, it's amazing. I think it's important for all of us to know that worldwide there are 890 different freshwater mussel species, but in North America, the greatest diversity is here, the mussels, and in the Ohio River system alone, 130 different mussels, very high diversity here. Because of, okay, this is the seriously coolest thing I've ever learned. I'm not a malacologist, I'm an archeologist and working with malacologists in our research, uh, he explained to me how fish are a host for fresh waters, mussels. And if you don't have the fish, the mussels can't live. What these mussels do is they filter water constantly. They improve water quality because they, they um, filter out bacteria, algae and, and pollutants and so forth. So if you've got good water quality for the mussels, you've got good water quality for the fish and with good water quality of mussels and fish, people have many more resources to exploit. The native peoples knowing this would live sometimes near those mussel shoals, those very riffly areas where uh, mussel beds would be in the larger rivers, particularly where a large river joined with another river. These um, mussel shoals can hold over 30 species of mussels or more. And um, they are very, very diverse. Okay. Some of these mussels are really choosy when it comes to the host fish. So for example, the purple wartyback wants catfish and catfish only. Thank you very much. Other mussels would prefer, I don't know, some different kinds of fish, but not a lot. And then there are others like the three ridge freshwater mussel that is, is I don't know, is, um, isn't choosy apparently. It prefers bass, sunfish, perch, crappie, pike, garfish, catfish, drum, and red horse. So, when archeologists recover examples of three ridge mussels or purple wartyback mussels, 
they can make inferences not only about the water quality that the mussels live in, but inferences about the um, fish species as well. Okay. I must tell you that it was such a thrill to take a look at Haig and Cicerillo's report about freshwater mussels in Kentucky and to see the information that we've collected from archeological sites that I've worked on in this state. The one that I'm talking about, I'm pulling the information from today is the Thompson site and you can see it indicated there with the red arrow. But there are several other triangles on this map of archeological sites where I have worked or friends of mine have worked before. It's really quite exciting. Okay, so at the Thompson site, they found, well, our malacologist um, was able to identify 31 different species of freshwater mussels, some of which at that point were endangered or nearly extinct. We found them in a dense concentration of artifacts and charcoal and mussel shells. Most of the mussels were pig toe, some were club shell, but we had a good representation of the purple warty back. Some of the species that were recorded from the Thompson site were 11 species that are rarely found in modern surveys today. And this is why it was very important for the malacologist's perspective on an overview of mussels. Most of these mussels that were recovered from the Thompson site require shoals, riffle areas in major rivers. Not surprising because the Thompson site is on the bank of the Ohio River. Okay. And what did we learn from the analysis of the freshwater mussels recovered from a Native American village site that was occupied from 1000 to 1200 AD? Well, there was a diverse large river fauna, both mussels and fish in the Ohio River that there probably was a shoal near their, their um, village. This is not surprising if I should tell you that their village was located across from the confluence of the Scioto River and the Ohio River. So you can imagine the shoals there in the water. Shoals are wadeable. You can you can cross across the river at that point. I should tell you that the warrior's path crossed the Ohio River at this spot. Diverse stream habitats, excellent habitat development, well-developed fish fauna, and therefore very good water quality. Can you imagine then Standing on that river bank, your village is in back of you. You're looking out across the Ohio River. It is sparkling in the sun, clear all the way down to the um, bottom of the, of the river. The mussel shoals are there glistening in the sunlight too. Families may be collecting freshwater mussels, bringing them back to your village and using them for a variety of purposes. What's important to rem remember though, is that the archeological site is not a one-to-one -one correlation or connection with the natural habitat there in the river. The native peoples have selected particular species that they want for either food or for the various uses that they put the shell to. Therefore, many of the shells that are uh, were recovered have very heavy shells. Another thing that might be impacting the number of species and the type of species that were recovered from the archeological site is issues of preservation. Those with very thin shells or thinner shells and ones that are perhaps a smaller mature um, freshwater mussel uh, may not be represented in the 
in the material collection that we made from that archeological site. So very good water quality, no real need for a fresh water, for a, a, a water quality uh, legislation from, from a government. This is what the Ohio River looked like centuries ago. And it's those freshwater mussels that archeologists have recovered from uh, the places where native people lived that give us a window into ancient water quality. If any of you are interested in more information about this site or other things related to archeology, span just go onto our Kentucky Archeological Survey website and you can find my email there. Thanks Renee so much for having me. Well, Gwen, that was wonderful. You know, um, I love the, the way that you can actually connect the past and the present together and help us see what the Ohio River may have looked like from, from what Dr. Gumper just told us to what it was centuries ago. So thank you for that. We greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, well, that is all we have for today. Um, Again, you can always go to fromthewoodstoday.com to watch any of our, our shows. We have them all listed there. This one will be um, posted sometime within the next week or so. And we greatly appreciate um, you joining us. And um, again, if you have any questions, you can just go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can send us show ideas or questions or anything that you may have there. But until then, we greatly appreciate you joining us and we will see you next week. Take care. Bye. From the woods today